We'll give it just a couple more minutes, Felicia. Yeah, no worries. All right, we might as well get started. Uh, thanks everyone for logging into our sixth and final Hort Academy webinar. Today we've got Alicia from um, Jack's J.R. Peters Fertilizer, and she's going to talk to us about pH management and also nutrient deficiencies. Um, as always, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. You move your mouse around, type in your question, and um, it'll pop up to me, and then I will jump in and ask Alicia the question. And we're also going to start today off with just a short poll. Uh, just so we can kind of find out um, what people's testing habits are. So if you wouldn't mind, answer the question on the poll here. And then after, oh, I suppose maybe 30 seconds or a minute, I'll, um, I will minimize that and then Alicia will get started. So we'll kind of just wait for the poll to take place. All right, here are the results. So it looks like we got some nevers there. So this will be a good, uh, a good presentation. Awesome. We got some every other week and once a month folks too. So that's a good thing yep. too. Yep, absolutely. So, all right, Alicia, the floor is yours. All right. Let's, can I minimize this? There we go. Thanks. All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. Well, I'm sorry, good morning. It's still morning time officially, right? Uh, done so much today, it already feels like afternoon. So today we're gonna talk about nutrient deficiencies and remedies in spring crops. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the introduction, Steve. As Steve mentioned, I am Alicia Rittenhouse. I'm the Territory Sales Manager with Jack's uh, Water Soluble Fertilizers. Many of you are probably familiar with both our professional and our retail product. There's my email and my phone number is on this slide. So if you think of some questions after the presentation, you can also always give me a shout and ask questions or forward them over to Tessman and Tessman can send them over as well. So today's agenda, we're going to talk a little bit about pH, why it's important, what's the optimum and what impacts pH. If you have a question, please go ahead and use that Q&A and ask as we go along. You don't have to wait until the end. And that way, most likely if you have a question, somebody else has that exact same question and we can kill two birds with one stone. All right, so first up, um, what is pH? So pH stands for potential hydrogen. It's the measure of how acidic or basic something is. And it is determined by the number of hydrogen or hydroxy ions. So <clears throat> probably easier to understand from this chart, the more basic your pH, the more OH ions you have, and the more acidic your pH, your soil pH, the more hydrogen ions you have. And this gets in a little bit into, um, we, could, we could take a deep dive into this, um, but I'm gonna be honest with you, chemistry is not my first love. That's why I got into horticulture. Um, so, um, 
we'll see a little bit later on um, in the nitrogen packages, the different nitrogen sources in your fertilizer are going to impact this scale. Some of your fertilizer are gonna produce OH ions and increase your pH, and some will produce uh, H plus ions and decrease the pH. All right, so back to our poll. How often do you check your soil pH? Uh, it was pretty good um, sampling of answers there. There was a couple nevers, couple um, monthly. That's great. Um, I do not subscribe to a standard pH checking. I think it depends on the grower and the crop. Typically what we recommend is it's always nice to get a starting soil pH. So doing a soil pH um, before you plant or at planting before you do first fertigation. And then if it's a crop that you've struggled with in the past, then uh, weekly pH checks are really important. It helps give a baseline of what's going on. If it's a, a crop that you have are very comfortable with and you've not had issues with in the past, a monthly reading should suffice there. So the number one reason to check your pH is the pH of your soil media controls the availability of nutrients to your plant. If your pH, and I have a nice handy chart that we'll look at here in a second. So essentially, if the pH is not optimum for your crop, the roots will not take up the nutrients. It doesn't matter how much fertilizer you apply, if your pH is seven and a half in your soil, your petunias are not going to take up iron. And this is a really handy chart to take a look at. So on this chart here, we have from a pH of four, so a very acidic pH, to a very high pH of 10. Within this chart are each of the different nutrients that we encounter uh, most often nutrient deficiencies in produ greenhouse production. So using the example that I had just mentioned about iron and petunias, petunias um, like a low pH. They're down here in this, this kind of area. They like about a 5.8 to a 6.2. If your soil pH is up here closer to a seven, if you look at the band here of that's labeled iron, this denotes the availability of iron at these different pHs. So where I, this band is the widest, that's where iron is most available. And where it's the skinniest is where iron is least available. So this is an often scenario that we encounter um, with petunias and calabricoas. They enjoy or prefer a pH of 5.8 to 6.2, so somewhere down in here. Often growers are using a well water with a higher pH and high alkalinity, so it tends to make your soil pH creep up into the 7.5, uh, maybe even higher. And in this pH zone, the plant, the iron is not as soluble in the uh, solution in the soil, so it's hard for the plant to take it up. And this is just in general, and test, we'll, Testman will have these available if you want the slides. This blue area denotes the optimum range for most greenhouse crops is 5.8 to 6.2. In this same scenario, we'll look at a geranium, and we have some pictures later on. Your geranium prefers the higher end of that uh, optimum pH range. If you drop, if you're using an acidic fertilizer, like for example, a petunia feed, and you're irrigating your geraniums and marigolds with petunia feed, what happens is that soil pH in the container drops down and that makes iron overly available to the plant and will end up with things like iron toxicity. And again, I have some photos of that coming up. So in addition to checking your pH to make sure that the nutrients that you're applying through your fertilizer are available, there are other reasons to keep an eye on your pH. Um, for example, it's less expensive to correct 
nutrient deficiencies, if you can head them off, if you can watch your pH and know how your crop will respond to the increasing or decreasing pH levels. You can save money and labor in apply and, and in inputs, for example, applying Sprint. And what, what I, um, I think money, labor, those are all great reasons, but we're all time starved in the industry. And often we have issues pop up right before crop sale. So when you are checking pH, you can discover these problems before the visible symptoms appear. That saves time and crop quality and also equates to a higher quality crop and more price and a higher dollar. So we talked a little bit about pH so far, but I do want to make a note that pH and EC go hand in hand. The reason I wanted to focus on pH is um, to try to not to shove too much information into a short period of time. And I think if you're going to measure one thing and you only have time to measure one time one thing and you're going to be selective, pH, um, in my opinion, is the way to go. Ideally, you would measure both pH and EC. So EC is the electrical conductivity in the soil. It's a measure of the soluble salts in your growing media. And it's useful to prevent salt accumulation and burning. I often hear from growers that, you know, they water with a clear water every other water to prevent salt accumulation. But when that happens, you're also, you're flushing out the salt, but you're also driving the pH in the pot up. So it's nice if you're monitoring your pH and EC, it's nice to see how one impacts the other. And you can use that to determine uh, feed rate or leaching amounts. So this is a nice resource that I got from a greenhouse magazine online. Uh, it was a great article that was written by, um, I believe a couple of folks at Cornell. So this shows that <clears throat> as your substrate pH increases, the EC decreases. So there is a correlation between pH and EC, and you can use those two numbers, and through tracking them through the lifestyle life of a crop, you can get a feel for um, if you need to flush because your EC is high, or maybe your EC is really low and you didn't realize your injector isn't proportioning as it should. Um, those are all things that pH and EC readings can clue us in on. So jumping back to pH, what impacts pH? There are several different factors that impact your pH. So the first thing that impacts your uh, pH is crop, and we're going to go into each of, each of these um, briefly. So your crop impacts your pH, the media and soil type that you're using will impact your pH. Your water source, specifically the alkalinity of your water source, will impact your pH. And the type of fertilizer that you use and how frequently you use it can also impact your pH. So first up, we'll take a look at um, pH impact by crop. So interestingly, as we discussed a little bit earlier, petunias, they prefer a lower pH. But over the life cycle of the crop, they actually tend to raise the pH of the media. Um, similar to geranium, they prefer a higher pH, but over the life cycle of their crop, um, the um, media pH tends to reduce in their crop. So those are two great examples of two popular um, bedding plant crops in greenhouses. Uh, media source. So peat moss is very acidic. And typically, um, your soil provider, or if you're mixing it yourself, are adding a lime charge to counteract the acidity of the peat moss. The lime charge and the size of the um, lime particles can impact your pH. And then water source is a huge impact on your pH. Both the alkalinity and the pH of your source water um, should be taken into consideration. Alkalinity specifically, um, I like to think of it as your alkalinity as the amount of dissolved limestone that's in your water. So every time you're watering, you're applying 
dissolve the limestone to that soil, which is going to increase pH. Uh, well water typically has a high alkalinity and municipal water typically has a very low alkalinity. What we see often, um, especially in the area where I live, which is central Ohio, so I work with a lot of growers, central Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, we see a lot of well water that runs right about a 7.2 to 7.5 pH, so the pH isn't too bad, but the alkalinity can be upwards of 300 parts per million. Conversely, a municipal water type would be uh, would have a pH, um, they're typically somewhere around close to seven, and the alkalinity for a municipal water source is typically less than 100 parts per million of, of alkalinity. And so what that tells us and allows us to help um, select a fertilizer to match uh, your water type is an acidic fertilizer um, in a high, in, an acidic fertilizer paired with um, a low alkalinity water can really change the pH of the, the fertilizer solution and then also the pH of your soil that you're growing in. Um, so that is one thing that we take into consideration when matching uh, you with a, a fertilizer. The frequency of your watering will also impact your pH. So if you're often alternating your fertigation with clear water, again, think of that as you're just applying soluble limestone onto your crop, and that is going to drive your pH to go up over time. Um, something I should also add in here is the size of the soil volume. So the pH in a plug tray, for example, can change a lot more rapidly than a uh, 16 inch combo pot. So um, something to take in consideration is your soil volume. And then uh, the amount of leaching that you're using. So leaching results in a pH increase, similar to, similarly to alternating with clear water. The more you leach, the more you're flushing out your fertilizer salts and um, increasing your pH. So the, the fourth um, factor that impacts your pH is your fertilizer choices. So fertilizers are of basically can be grouped into three types. You have an acidic fertilizer, which will drive the pH of your soil down. A basic fertilizer, which over time is going to increase the pH of your soil. And then there are um, a few neutral fertilizers available that have no impact on the pH. This fertilizer impact on your pH is largely determined by the type and the ratio of nitrogen in the fertilizer you select. So I have a, a slide here um, with just the basics of the different types of fertilizer. And every fertilizer bag you have you should be able to refer to your fertilizer and it'll tell you how much of each of these types of fertilizer are in there. So the three types of fertilizer, we'll start with the nitrate first. NO3 is often how it's also indicated on your fertilizer bag. Nitrate fertilizer releases that OH ion and it, conversely it's going to cause your pH to go up. The impact it has on growth is it creates a toned, compact growth with short internodes. What's great about nitrate is you can use it at cooler temps. So if you are um, growing petunias outside in early spring, if you're moving crops out of the greenhouse out into like a field production type situation, you want to make sure the fertilizer you're using has a high amount of nitrate nitrogen. The second type of nitrogen is ammonium nitrogen, NH4. When ammonium nitrogen, um, what it does is it releases uh, H plus ion and that lowers pH. So typically, the co most common scenario, 90% of the customers that we come across, they have a well water 
that is high alkalinity and they do not want to add acid to their production. So they ask us for a fertilizer to help them manage their pH, which is great. And in that situation, um, a high ammonium fertilizer is typically what people select, but you need to take into account as to when you're going to use uh, fertilizer with ammonium in it. It creates a soft, lush growth. It creates larger leaves, and it um, tends to make the plants have longer inner nodes, so not as much compact growth as your nitrate nitrogen. The challenge with ammonium nitrogen is using it at warmer temps. So um, the ammonium nitrogen, it needs to go through a nitrogen cycle in order to be in a, more of a usable um, uh, form for the plant. We often call this our bathing suit fertilizer, so it should not be used in the greenhouse unless you would be comfortable wearing your bathing suit, um, both afternoon and nighttime temperatures in the greenhouse. The third type of nitrogen is urea nitrogen, and urea is, actually has a neutral charge, and very little urea is taken up by the plant. It relies on so soil microbes to com convert to ammonium. And we'll look at a couple of the popular formulations and how this breaks down in their nitrogen packages. Alicia? Yeah. Will the urea, after it's converted into ammonium, have the same effect on the soil? Will it, will it drive pH down a little bit? Yes. I think is the question. OK. Yeah, that's correct. So uh, to, to back up, I'll. One of the things um, uh, we often get a question about is um, a lot of times somebody uses like let's say a, a 201020 is what they use in their greenhouse and they run into a problem. Um, maybe their petunias are a little bit chlorotic and they're looking for something to green them up. Um, often we will take these calls and we recommend petunia feed and uh, often that grower also has a retail store and says, well, we have um, petunia feed in the containers, you know, available to our customers. Can we just use that? The Jack's Classic products, the retail products in the tubs, they um, use a lot of urea as their nitrogen source because those fertilizers are designed to be used outside in either um, a soilless mixed containers or in the garden. Um, and so for that reason, we don't recommend petunia feed in the Jack's Classic tub to be used in your greenhouse because most of that nitrogen is this urea. So good question. So here um, is a couple of uh, formulations. Now these are specifically, I use Jack's um, professional formulations. Every fertilizer manufacturer manufactures their fertilizer slightly differently, so always consult the label. Um, <clears throat> so we'll kind of look at um, a few fertilizers. I always like to start with a triple 20. Well, a lot of folks still um, use triple 20 in the greenhouse. It was originally developed for use in outdoor production, not in the greenhouse. So for example, our triple 20 is 10% urea and 10% urea, and then 6% nitrate nitrogen, and 4% ammonium nitrogen. If you add up the ammonium and the urea, this gives you your, what's often termed as ammoniacal nitrogen. So 14% of the nitrogen in our triple 20 is ammonium, is ammoniacal versus a nitrate nitrogen. So for growing at this time of year, which I'm going to assume a lot of you folks have a similar weather to what we're experiencing in Michigan and Ohio, it's been cool, it's been cloudy, it's been a struggle to keep the greenhouses warm. We've had some really windy weather. In situations like this, triple 20 is not necessarily the best fertilizer to use at this time of year. Yes, it's acidic, which is, this is a um, guide to acidity over here. This is the calcium uh, equivalent uh, pounds and calcium carbonate equivalent per pounds. So this kind of gives you an idea. So um, with a rating of 555, 
a triple 20 is more acidic than the 407 cce of a 2010-20. So um, triple 20 tends to still be the gold standard outdoor vegetable production type of fertilizer. You, it does have its place in the greenhouse, um, but at this time of year is not the best time of year to use it um, because you do need those warm temperatures in order to get that urea to convert to an ammoniacal nitrogen. If you don't have those warm temperatures, you're basically just wasting nitrogen. And with half of the nitrogen um, in this product coming from urea, so half of the nitrogen that you're applying is most likely not available at this time of year. So with the advent of soilless mixes and growing more in the greenhouse in soilless mixes, 2010-20 uh, came on the scene. So you'll notice with the 2010-20, much more um, nitrate nitrogen, so a lot, uh, a lot more friendly for growing in a greenhouse at cooler temps. Um, still probably not my favorite for this time of year, um, mostly not because of the nitrogen package, but mostly because of the high amount of phosphorus in 2010-20, which also tends to make plants uh, get a little leggy on the bench. So, um, as phosphorus became more and more expensive, um, Jax, as well as other fertilizer companies and academic researchers started to do research on how much phosphorus do plants really need. Um, and with that came to the evolution of a 21520. Again, it's a, it is an acidic fertilizer. It does have a lot more nitrate nitrogen, a little bit of ammonium nitrogen, so it's, a, it's more balanced and weighs heavily towards more nitrate nitrogen. Um, this is a great all-purpose formula. The great thing about 21520, very similar to a 201020, only you have half the amount of phosphorus, um, and that helps keep plants uh, more compact, and um, you have a safer nitrogen source when you're uh, working with cooler temperatures. Then also kind of arriving on the scene shortly after the 21520 is our 25515. Also an acidic formulation, a lot more nitrogen in one bag is the benefit with this fertilizer. It is quite acidic and you can see 608 CCE. Um, but again, it, it has a high amount ammonium nitrogen, um, not quite a 50-50 split, uh, but, but close. Another one of our fertilizers, 20-3-19, so our petunia feed. Um, also an acidic fertilizer is a really popular um, for growers who do not want to add acid to their water. We often um, recommend this petunia feed um, and in conjunction with a 21-520, using the 21-520 as a, as a base fertilizer, and then the 20 dash three dash 19 as a um as a um supplement for all of the crops like petunias and callies and vinca that um, are iron inefficient and they like a lower ph nice nitrogen package on this a lot more safer for outdoor growing um, have a grower in my area who's looking at this currently and evaluating it um, because their formulation that they're currently using for outdoor production, they move their petunias outside um, the first or second week of April and finish them off cold. And they were using a formulation that had a lot more urea in it and they were seeing a lot of chlorosis. So this is something that they're looking at evaluating for this year. Um, and then uh, I added this one in, the 2177 acid. It's an old formulation. A lot of growers use this um, it, to lower pH. And the 2177 is very similar to the triple 20 in that the nitrogen package has almost half of the nitrogen. It comes from urea. So again, this is, uh, is not a good fertilizer choice for this time of year for cool temps. Um, 2177 is uh, better suited for sometime after Memorial Day. And uh, I, I do have a picture. Um, I have a grower in Wisconsin who uh, likes to use 2177 and, and kind of runs into some problems every now and then. And I have a photo to show you in just a second. Um, 
so we kind of went over this in the previous slide. Um, fertilizer selection, the triple 20 just has a lot more urea, also has more phosphorus, which causes stretching. Um, a 2177 is very, very acidic, so it definitely will lower your pH, but when you use it in cool weather, it causes ammonium toxicity. So we're going to go, I have a, several photos. I went through a lot of my photo library and pulled out some photos. Um, I don't always have before and after photos. I'm not sure that I have any in this set, um, but it's uh, just a nice kind of review of some of common production challenges that a lot of growers seem to be um, experiencing. Uh, some of these photos are from this year, some of them are from last year. So um, about nine out of 10 growers that have plugs in the last couple of weeks that I've stopped to visit, they're having iron chlorosis due to high pH. So you can see in this photo, if you look, you can even see a little bit of purpling that may be indicating that um, it's deficient in some phosphorus as well. In this particular situation, um, the grower has very, very high alkaline water and uses a acid injection, um, but they were using uh, mist irrigation. And because of the low flow on the mist, the acid injector was not kicking on and their pH was up around um, close to seven on these plugs. That high of a pH made the iron that was available, uh, made the iron in the soil unavailable. And so to um, remedy this, um, they did a couple of treatments of a 21520, um, which, is, which is acidic, but does not have any urea in it. It's awful warm in their prop house too. Um, so they were able to use the 21520 acidic fertilizer, um, hand water drench to pull the pH down. They saw about a 0.2 pH drop with every irrigation. Um, they did three hand irrigations of the 21520 at 100 parts per million over a two week time period. And when I was there last week to look at their plugs, they had uh, completely turned around. Uh, except for one variety they were still struggling with that came in um, budded and, and quite hungry. Uh, you could also use a petunia feed in this situation. The petunia feed um, would do two things. It's an acidic fertilizer, so it would help drop the pH. But petunia feed also has a blend of iron chelates. Um, an iron chelate just basically means that there's an iron molecule and another molecule kind of attached to it, like a carrier, or you could think of it as a wingman. And the plant can take up that, uh, that iron chelate uh, easier than it can take up just iron out of the soil. And those iron chelates are available in petunia feed from a pH of, I believe it's like four up to about a pH of nine. So it's a twofold um, using petunia feed on something like that, driving down the pH and then um, adding an iron chelate that's available at a higher pH. Um, in this situation, they did not have petunia feed available except for um, in the classic tub. And uh, since that's not suitable really in the greenhouse production and they didn't want to wait to get petunia feed available, they you know, started with 21,520. Uh, this grower also, um, they check their pH pretty often, but it also happened to be that their pH probe broke and they were waiting on a new um, pH probe, which took like three weeks for them to get. So they were flying a little bit blind. So that's, also, that's why it's nice to know pH and EC going into this. Um, it's just like if you were to take your kid to the doctor uh, and you tell the doctor your kid is sick, and one of the first things they ask you is, you know, did they have a fever? Okay, uh, you can say yes or no. It kind of helps clue in as to what's going on. pH and EC, same thing. Think of it as uh, your vitals. Um, again, this is a iron chlorosis due to uh, a high p soil pH. Another similar situation, different grower, high water alkalinity. Um, they don't use acid to treat their water and um, through the beginning of production, it was very 
cool and cloudy. They weren't watering very much, so the, they weren't able to get fertile feed into the root zone to help drive the pH down. So the pH in their pots crept up and made iron unavailable. Um, in this uh, situation, uh, they, they were able to turn it around um, within about 10 days using petunia feed. Another um, plant that I have seen um, some growers struggling with is uh, hellebores. So um, while it's not a bedding plant, it's definitely in production about this time of year, uh, they tend to just really struggle with iron availability. In this particular one, we did um, um, some soil testing and some tissue testing to kind of troubleshoot the problem. They prefer a lower pH. Uh, like hellebores aren't super, super popular, so it's hard to find production information. But according to Walters Gardens, they do prefer a lower pH. Um, again, this was a, um, a situation where the grower um, does not use acid. They have high water alkalinity, um, and they were using an acidic fertilizer but what they were doing was only applying twice a week fertilizer. The rest of the time they were clear watering and that drove the pH up. And again, you have a situation where iron is unavailable and similar to petunias, um, you can, similar to the petunias that we just saw is um, you can use a acidic fertilizer to help drive down the pH so that the iron becomes available what's in the soil. Um, or you can use something like a petunia feed with the iron chelates available, and then you get a, a, a two shot on it. You drop, work on dropping your pH and supply iron chelates that are available at a higher pH. Uh, petunia feed is super popular for this reason. I've seen it used on petunias, callies, vinca, basil, um, tomatoes, mums, a uh, few growers I know swear by using petunia feed on their poinsettias, um, often widely used in the greenhouse, but you can run into challenges using um, petunia feed, specifically on crops like geraniums and marigolds that prefer a higher pH. And what happens in this situation you can see these geraniums start getting um, almost like a, a hmm, like a freckling, I would call it, a yellow freckling on the leaf, and then you start to see some burn on the margin. When, you, when you're using an acidic fertilizer, um, especially like a petunia feed on geranium marigold group, the pH goes too low. And when the pH goes low, then all that iron that's available in the soil, the plants tend to suck it up, even though they don't really need it, and, what, and then they can't use it, and it becomes toxic in the leaf and in the plant tissues, and that's where you start to run into some problems with acidic fertilizers, like a petunia feed um, in, a, in a small house. So in this situation, um, it's, hard to turn around some of these leaves. You can see this one here, right, kind of in the middle upper left. It's already starting to crisp at the leaf. There's not a lot you can do to recover that leaf, um, but in this situation you can use a basic fertilizer or even do some clear water flushing to flush the salts out and get the pH to go back up um, or use a CalMag fertilizer. Again, this is a, a good example of why to track your pH and EC throughout the crop life because you could have picked up on this about two weeks before these symptoms showed up. Um, something recently I have seen, and I apologize, this isn't the greatest picture, but these are tomato seedlings. There is some purpling on these seedlings. So we see a lot of phosphorus deficiency, especially in tomato seedlings. Um, so if you're growing tomatoes from seed, something to keep an eye on. In this particular situation, they were um, trying to troubleshoot an issue that they were having with their tomato plants. And on this flat, they used zero fertilizer. So it's a 
pretty pronounced uh, purpling on this one, but uh, just keep an eye on it. This phosphorus deficiency can also be induced by low temperatures. So we're gonna switch a little bit. Um, there's a couple of nutrient deficiencies that I've come across that seem to be pretty common, but they are not necessarily directly tied to pH of the um, soil media, but I wanted to show you a couple of pictures of them. Um, so earlier we were talking about the 2177 uh, acid fertilizer, and I mentioned the nitrogen package is mostly urea, and you can run into some problems with that when it is cool and cloudy. So this is a primrose. Um, and what happens is the cool and cloudy temperatures are not conducive to a lot of plant growth. So the plant is not actively growing and it tries to store um, what urea gets converted to ammonium or whatever ammonium is in the fertilizer, it tries to store it. And because it's not using it, it uh, it accumulates and becomes toxic. Uh, this is often um, thought to be um, iron chlorosis. Uh, it's mistaken for iron chlorosis, but and it's really a ammonium toxicity. And for the leaves that are not yet burnt so and crispy, so these guys, they'll snap out of it with some sunshine, some clear water drenches, and a little, um, maybe even a little, a CalMag formulation there. To, and a similar um, nutrient deficiency that uh, see on begonias quite often is a calcium deficiency. So in, in here you can see on some of the new leaf, it's distorted, sometimes it's thick, sometimes it is um, kind of what I would describe as warty or bumpy. Um, calcium is very important in holding together the cell walls and when calcium is not getting to the growing point of the plant you get a deficiency that creates this distorted growth. Calcium only moves through the plant when water moves through the plant. So in this particular situation these begonias were in a hoop house, a really low hoop house. It was cold, um, it had been very, very cloudy for quite a while. We hadn't seen sunshine and um, not a lot of watering going on. And what was happening is just stagnant airflow. And so there, the plant was not transpiring water. So it wasn't moving the water and calcium from the roots up to the growing region. Um, and so to kind of combat this, uh, if you've run into this before, uh, really look at airflow and try to um, reduce the humidity in the greenhouse, get the air moving, um, get air moving through it, and so that the plant will transpire and bring up that calcium from the roots along with water uh, to prevent the calcium deficiency. So we went over just a couple of the most common things that I've been seeing, um, but I also wanted to leave you with some resources that are easy to find um, online. There is a consortium of extension agents, and I'm gonna see if I can figure out how to flip this over and show you my, um, my browser here. So there is a, First one is e-grow.org. eGrow is a consortium of um, extension agents uh, and research academics from multiple universities, uh, mostly Midwest, uh, Central Plains, East Coast area. And they do a great job of getting out timely alerts so in this section is alerts. Um, you can search their alerts. You can sign up for the alerts, which I would highly suggest. Um, always very timely. There's no ads. There's no fluff to it. They get right to the point. If you go to their home screen, it's right here, egrow.com. You can subscribe to their uh, alerts. Comes right to your e email box. Um, here's one of the great 
um, resources I found on their site. This is a plant nutrient deficiency key. So if you do head a snag and you think something is a plant nutrient deficiency, you can walk through this um, key and it'll give you some ideas of what you might be, what type of deficiency you might be looking at. Um, again, here's that website, egrow.org. Um, same group of academics have also um, started a new website, um, most, mostly focused on nutritional monitoring. This one is called fertdirtandsquirt.com, and I'll show you what that one looks like. Um, this is relatively new website. I think they just launched it last fall. Um, great things on here. There are guides and videos. So if you're interested in doing uh, more pH EC um, extraction methods, um, meter calibration on here. They have sampling procedures for all the different types of size, excuse me, sizes of, um, of uh, plant material. They also have corrective procedures, a um, couple other information on here. They do have crop fact sheets. So they have a book that you can down download on monitoring pH and EC. Then they have crop fact sheets on um, various annuals. So this will tell you what kind of pH category you're looking for, um, target ECs, and just other information um, about that particular crop. So that's always uh, super handy to have. Also vegetables, leafy greens, and herbs, some of your potted crops. And yeah, they're still working on the perennial section. So um, they have that. They also have a crop search, so you can search yourself. There's some other links on here as well. Um, and then some sponsor acknowledgements that they do. Uh, J.R. Peters is not affiliated with them. Um, I know several of the extension agents who are involved in it. It's just a really solid uh, informational source and it's always very timely as soon as some of those extension agents start seeing issues uh, with some of the growers they work with they start writing about it so that's um, super helpful and so the next up is um, methods and logs so there was a great article here and I put, uh, put in the link uh, it's a greenhouse grower article on managing uh, P, pH and EC. And then also um, there is an, a mobile app or mobile website really called GrowZone Tracker. If you wanna start logging your pH and EC there, that's super helpful. Also, um, you can talk to your sales rep with Tessman. There are, for less than a $200 investment, you can get a pH meter and an EC meter, the calibration solutions that you need to keep them calibrated. And you can start um, checking your pH and EC. Start out with just a crop that you've had issues with in the past and you can expand it from there. And then also I wanted to mention if you run into a snag and you need some extra help troubleshooting, J.R. Peters has a lab services. That's how we actually started our company was through uh, soil testing. Um, we have available water and fertilizer testing, media testing, both field and soil. And then we also offer tissue testing. So no pathogen testing, but everything that you would need to cover any nutrient deficiencies. And with that, when you use our lab, you get um, support from us. So in addition to myself, there's Dr. Carrie Peters, which is Jack's um, daughter. So she's the third generation in the um, family business. Crystal Snyder has 10 plus years of experience in the industry. And then uh, Bill, who's uh, more based on the East Coast, he's got 35 plus years in the industry as well. So when you utilize our lab um, and you get your results, you can always reach out to me and uh, I can go through it with you and we can look at the lab results and try to figure out what's going on. And that's it. So I appreciate your time. Hopefully this was really helpful. Hopefully I've inspired you to look at your pH and EC more than once a month and um, check, it on the, check it especially on your troublesome crops. 
and don't hesitate to call or email or reach out with any questions that you have. One quick question came across here, Alicia. Um, yeah. The difference between sulfated and chelated ions in a fertilizer, is that something you can discuss relatively quickly or is it something that's a whole nother topic? Um, I can give you the very, very basics on that, and that is, um, does, I, I believe, and I can double check with Carrie on this, because she's our master formulator of fertilizers, the chelated iron, uh, the chelated, um, like, for example, the chelated irons, they have some sort of carrier on them, and each, each type of chelated iron is soluble at a different pH and has a different carrier. And I can't remember if they're all sulfated or there's only a couple that are sulfated, but I can double check on that and, and let you know. Do you have the name of who's asking? I do. Okay, cool. I can get that information on and I'll send it on to you. Okay, sounds good. Um, that was the only other one, so but thanks, Alicia. Great info as usual. Um, and if any other questions pop up, um, I'll get them over to you, okay? Okay, sounds good. Thank you All so right. much. You bet, and thanks everyone for participating in the uh, Testament Horde Academy this year. I hope these webinars have been informative and, and helpful. Um, if you have suggestions for future topics, let me know and I'll see if I can find somebody that uh, will give a presentation for us. Uh, with that, um, it concludes this webinar. Hope everybody has a great day. Thanks.